Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 37 of the Gateway Project, in which we are supposed to be launching the SPM-2, as well as doing the moon landing that I promised in the last episode, check in on Joseph, and also do a world first once again, and you'll see which one that is coming up here real soon. However, we're going to start off by launching the SPM-2, and did you see what just happened to the camera right there? So remember that thing with the radiators that I got from the near future? Watch this. Here we go again. And bam. The, what's happening is those radiators are shifting. For some reason, they're moving way away from the camera, way down back toward KSC, and that causes the center of mass to shift way down as well because it's averaging out the masses of the things. But then all of a sudden it comes back again, and I'm like, what just happened? And I look, aha. The radiators were destroyed somehow. I don't know what's causing it, but clearly those radiators are, for some reason, out of the blue, not working anymore. They were working fine, and now they're not. I don't know. So what I'm going to do in this episode is, after we dock up this SPM-2, I'm going to edit the save file to fix those radiators by actually subbing them out for a different type of radiator. And while I'm in there, I think I'll do a little bit of cleanup, maybe remove some parts and uh, perhaps remove some docking nodes, make the ship count smaller because of that, and hopefully speed things up a little bit because it's been getting really slow around the station again. But before we do that, I promised last time we'd get to the moon landing, and here it is. This is the moon lander that we started up at the end of the last episode. Now this is actually three stacked segments that come and dock to each other and create uh, all the legs, or like two of the legs are on one side and two of the legs are on the other, and there's the, the three cylinders. Uh, you're gonna see here in a second, watch this. Okay, so that top one there, we already docked one, now we'll take the second one, move that over, and dock it on the side. Now you're getting the idea, right? We got the four engines because there's two on each side and the two legs on each side. One side has RTGs for power, the other one has a backup solar power. We probably don't need that though. I got the one radiator right there to cool things down, and then uh, there's lots of living space inside. For the three Kerbals inside, once I activate this uh, CO2 scrubber that will get the CO2 out and provide oxygen for us, and then that uh, converter there that'll take the waste water and turn it back into regular water, that should be enough for the three Kerbals to last about a hundred days, I think. I put plenty of food in there, lots of snacks. So now we're making our intercept here with the moon, and we'll just make a little adjustment to get ourselves up onto the same orbit where we'll be able to make a landing near that other lander that's already down there, the Morpheus lander from previously that's sitting at that statue or whatever it is that must have come through from the other side, from the other world, or wherever it, it might be. Now as we zoom in down low over the surface, we're getting ready to start our retro burn that will capture an orbit at the moon. The maneuver that we made when we first entered the moon's SOI allowed us to get pretty close to where we want to be, but we do need to make one last inclination change here to make sure that we're flying over that landing site. And there you can see it right there. We're going right over it. So now with Kerbin rising on the horizon and us zooming over the surface, coming into the LZ any moment now. We'll check the map and see how we're doing. There it is. Okay, so we're pulling down our orbit to place it right over the landing zone. And now we're in our actual landing burn. Jebediah is of course at the controls and as we come over the lip of the crater, we can actually see our landing spot now. There it is. Oh, look at that. Look how close we're coming down right on top of it. If we just angle a little bit up, we can make sure that we're coming down in the right spot. 
It's a delicate ballet of sometimes aiming at the horizon and sometimes aiming at the ground to make sure that the landing spot doesn't get too far off from where we want to be. And it looks like putting Jebediah at the controls was the right decision because with a little tweak to the right and a little tweak to the left, he's bringing us down practically right on top of the anomaly and the other lander. So any moment now, we're going to be on the ground and he can go out and take a look at that anomaly and see if there's anything special about it. We're registering some increased radiation from it right now. So far, the levels are not harmful, so we're going to be playing it safe but not too safe as you know the fate of the universe is on the line right now so we can't be too cautious perhaps somebody will need to make a sacrifice at some point who knows but in the here and now we're 80 70 60 50 meters from the ground 40 30 easing down very gently 20 meters 15 10, and here we go, touching down very gently, and we are on the surface. We need to go out and check that anomaly now, but before we do that, we need to take a look at the radiation levels and make sure that it's not suicidal to go near it. Meanwhile, back here at Kerbin, we're still dealing with that launch. We were off on our inclination just a bit on this one, so we'll adjust that and get ourselves into a trajectory there where we can now come in close to the KSS and deliver this second Russian science module that will complete the additional science sections that we were going to do on that part of the space station that would in our dimension eventually be part of the new space station once the actual ISS were to get decommissioned. As we move in close to the station and we switch into that segment where you're within that two and a half kilometers of your target, which causes the uh, target to start actually rendering all of its parts and processing all of its physics all the time. I have come to the conclusion that there's not a lot left I can do about the save file. Uh, I have, after I docked this up, I have gone in and I've tried playing around with things and taking out extra parts and doing all of the tricks that have gotten us this far and my frame rate is still tanking. It's taking about an hour of real life to generate one minute of the episodes now because uh, up near the station that is because it is so time consuming to do something like bring in this new science module on top of that we're running into all these new bugs like those radiators aren't working uh, there were radiators on these two science modules but in both cases they were destroyed by g-forces on liftoff because something buggy is going on with them where they're moving kilometers away from the actual part itself during liftoff, which is then causing a lot of torque on the part or something like that. So we're gonna dock here any second and Bob is gonna go out on his EVA and you're gonna start to see, if you look closely, look up where the radiators are, you'll notice that the radiators, I didn't actually notice this until I was replaying this during the edit of the episode, but the radiators are missing. Well, Bob's going out here, he's facing the wrong direction to see it right now, but he's out there grabbing that launch hardware, and just like when we launched the SPM-1, we're going to put all that stuff on this space tug that's going to take it all back to Kerbin and destroy it, reducing my part count a little, but not enough to actually have an effect. When we get a chance here, you're gonna look up and you're gonna see that the radiators are missing again, and I actually notice it later on in this episode while doing, again, the edit of this, that I see them actually actually out in space and I didn't see that at the time but but we get to see that now so here watch this one oh right in between those solar panels oh so close there they are look there's the radiators right there floating about a kilometer away they were just to the uh, north like up toward the top of the screen and the left of the screen 
Anyway, this is where I first noticed a problem. Bob was done with his EVA and he's on his way back and take a look there. I noticed that the radiators are missing. So this is where I decided, okay, well, I need to try to reduce my part count. And so I did the fixing of the radiators at the same time that I did my save file hacking. I forced a model swap of a model that would actually show up. So all of those radiators are gone. Also, the one in the Nauka is fixed. The one in the science modules are now showing up. You can see them on the bottom down there, but my frame rate still didn't improve. Are you just dying to see what's inside the moon lander? Well, here it is. Your prayers have been answered. We have a 3.75 rocket with all the appropriate boosters and everything on the outside of it. And up here we have another second stage, which all of that you've seen before. It's just the KLS-6, the expanded fairing version of my 3.75 rocket systems. And then down here, you can see what I did was without having tested any of it, I just know in the past that when I have these long stacks, I need to do stuff like stick struts on the outside. So I put these decouplers here and a bunch of cubic struts that started going up. However, when I got up to this point, I saw that I was gonna hit the landing gear. And so I jogged it to the side here and then just kept it going up. And so it goes all the way up to here and just provides a way for me to strut everything together in every single direction. So, satisfying two of our requirements so far, we had the big SRBs on the side, and along the side here we have lots of struts. You can see that if we look inside this one, we also have lots of snacks. Moving our way up, all of these compartments represent where my science will be done. So I have lots of science as well. So there we go, we have all of the four S's. So if we grab these things off the side, now this is what it looks like when they actually decouple and we have our stack just ready to go and dock together. I'll work from the top. We have our lights and we have our communications and totally unnecessary solar panels. Life support down here and some engine mounting, some fuel and engines and more fuel down here that goes up into those engines. Some big gyroscopes under there and landing legs, but only two landing legs because this whole piece here decouples and flies down like this and docks up right there. That brings us to the second one where we have all of our RTGs for the power and another lander and some more engines and fuel and landing legs and monopropellant and all of that. And then this one undocks and works its way down and docks right there, giving us what our lander looks like. When we look inside here, we can see that this decoupler is actually going to stay attached to the bottom of that other thing. It wouldn't be on the top there. We have the command center and a radiator, all of that life support with all those snacks inside and the R more RTGs just to power everything. All of them have some way to power. Like this one had the solar panels to power it when it was decoupled. This one had the RTGs and this one has a whole bunch of RTGs. We work our way down through all of these. You can see that that's pretty much it. And it has more lights. Back on Mun, the analysis has been done and it looks like it is safe to go outside. So Jebediah is going to go on the EVA and go take a look at this physical anomaly that we have found here. There are three different types of anomalies. We have our physical kind like this one. Oh, holy cow, that thing is gigantic. Also, it has some strange symbols on it. We need to go take a better look at what these are. We've seen these sorts of symbols before when we were looking at the KSS manual and at some of the stuff that came out of the Minmus anomaly. We're not quite sure what they mean, but, and there seems to be some sort of a thing here with colors and star-shaped symbols and stripes on it. That must be important somehow as well. Now this, this looks like a spaceship. We know what that means. So uh, what this might mean is we need to make something that's like that and try and analyze its properties. But 
Jebediah has gone and gotten some very valuable science, and we need to get this science sent back to Kerbin right away for analysis. Right now, though, we have another VAB trip to make. Our science and power modules both basically look the same, and they went up on these KLS-6 3.75 expanded fairing launchers. We can zoom in here and see that these are big science centers with a little tug up on top. I flipped that around. I showed that when I was in orbit. So it's on a cubic strut right here. And when that is here, let me undo that just for a second. So when the when Bob goes out on EVA and he grabs that little strut right in there and pulls it away, that causes it to decouple. So I didn't actually need to put a decoupler or even a docking port. I just pull away that strut and the whole thing can disappear. Then we have ourselves four big solar panels to provide the power in the science and power part of the name. Uh, this was the old radiator that I was using right here. I was testing it out too. I left one on there when I was testing it recently. I wanted to see what was going on with those broken radiators and ultimately decided that I was going to not use those anymore and I came up with a new one. Just to give you a look at the new one, it's this one here. I took a Cosmos solar panel, this TKS solar array, and I repurposed it. So now my radiators look like these. That's my big one that I'm using on the outside of the station, the all the giant radiators. And then on these little modules like this one, I'm using this small one, which is still the Cosmos TKS with no texture, but it's been scaled down. So one of them was scaled up, the other was scaled down. Either way, now those are my new radiators. You can see that we have some launch hardware here on the outside, all of which gets taken away and a docking port. And there's more lights all around the outside of it. But if we ignore those lights for a second, you'll see that the rest of it is a welded part. Looking over here on my pod section, you can see there it is, the SPM, one welded part. Back in orbit, we have nine of our astronauts, Kerbinauts, up there at the KSS. And so we're going to bring three of them back in the new Dragon capsule that we launched previously. We're going to see how well this performs. Remember, this has not been tested at all. So we'll uncouple here and use our Draco engines to retro fire. And these three brave Kerbinauts are going to find out whether this capsule really works to protect them and bring them back to Kerbin safely. And so far, so good. We have them coming back through the atmosphere with the heat shield working, but unfortunately those engines were mounted poorly. We go into a spin and they're not producing enough downward thrust to save our brave Kerbals. And thus, in the name of science, did Williams Kerman, Chow Kerman, and Noriega Kerman give their lives to discover the secrets of the universe and perhaps bring an end to the devastation that will be wrought by the anomalies unless some answer can be found. The great McGee Kerman has put together a few words to give tribute and honor to our fallen heroes. Oh, I have slipped the fickle bonds of Kerbin and leapt through the skies on science gilded wings. Upward I've climbed and joined the tumbling joy of sun-split skies, and done a million things you have not dreamed of, spun and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence, hovering there. I've chased the roaring wind along and flung my bold craft through endless halls of air, up up the long delirious burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace. 
where never Snick or even Ragnar flew, and while with silent, lifting mind I've tread the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my glove and touched the stars. We have ignition. We have lift off of the Antares vehicle for the Orb 1 mission. And Antares is on its way, delivering uh, Cygnus to orbit. Uh, all uh, continuing to go smoothly in the initial stages of uh, ascent for Antares. Avionics power systems remain uh, nominal. A modest amount of steering as the vehicle passes through max Q and its maximum dynamic pressure. Altitude is 45,000 feet. Avionics systems remain healthy. Standing by for main engine cutoff of stage one. Power nominal. And we have Miko. Bearing separation. Interstage separation. TVC battery initiated. Yeah, six minutes into the flight, all continue to go smoothly. Stage two ignition has occurred. We have a stage two ignition. Uh, pressures look nominal in the early part of the uh, Castor 30 burn. This is the, uh, the first flight of the enhanced performance Castor 30B motor. Uh, it'll burn about 128 seconds, uh, about uh, 12 seconds longer than the, the standard version of the motor that we flew on the first two missions. And stage, stage two burnout. Attitude remains nominal. T plus eight minutes. FTS is disabled. And we have payload separation. Cygnus is in orbit and Antares has initiated the uh, collision contamination avoidance maneuver. A very uh, smooth ascent uh, right on time at 1.07 p.m. Ten minutes later, Cygnus has now separated uh, from the upper stage with its orbital insertion altitude of about 150 by 185 miles. Yes, indeed, boys and girls, what you just saw right there was a solid rocket booster for a second stage because that's exactly what the real Antares rocket uses. They line things up just right, and then they use a solid rocket booster, which puts things in a much better orbit than what I just did right there. I've taken away everything else that I have orbiting so you can easily see me and the other space station as we set up the rendezvous, and you can see that I'm in a higher orbit than the space station. In reality, in our dimension, they would have been in a lower orbit, and that over the course of a few days, they would have boosted their orbit with various maneuvers in order to get themselves on a rendezvous. Uh, I was above, so I came in from up top. Now, just like in the real case, I am delivering cargo like life support, food, spare parts, that sort of thing. The real Cygnus orb brought up 700 kilograms in its flight. It was the third launch. The first two were just test launches. The third one was the one that actually proved that they could bring up cargo to the Interna International Space Station. They then loaded it up after taking all the stuff out. They loaded it with about 1,290 kilograms of cargo that was just going to be deorbited, a bunch of trash and whatnot. Now get a real good look right here because this might be one of the last things you see me docking to the KSS in my dimension here because this frame rate is so low that I have to come in over the course of, it took me a couple hours to get everything moved into position and docked up here. Uh, so with the frame rate down as low, it, as low as it is, I think the next episode might be our last. 8 a.m. Central Time. That is capture confirmed of Cygnus in the Orbital 1 flight. Of course, great news for the Orbital Sciences team up in Dulles, Virginia, uh, for this uh, company providing cargo to the ISS. Just calling to congratulate Orbital and those folks for a fantastic day of getting Cygnus birth. Well, whether we're coming up on the end or not, we can still take a look at the Cygnus orb in the Vehicle Assembly Building. And like always, why don't we begin with the bottom? So you saw that I didn't have any launch clamps on this, and that is because, here, let me move this up a little bit so we can see underneath it a little bit better. Oh, maybe a little bit higher. Higher, go, there we go. Okay, so see under there, I put some 6S compartments and a whole bunch of RTGs, and that means I don't actually need any launch clamps in order to provide power while I'm warping to wait for my orbit to come over the KSC. 
So I created this ring right here where I have all of those RTGs inside and then I just duplicated it twice on there and put that on a decoupler which then goes into normal KW rocketry parts like the engine and a fuel tank. One more fuel tank because I had a little extra power there that I could get for the Delta V. I tried to match the Delta V a little bit to the Antares rocket, but relative to what I would need on Kerbin. We also have our fairing here, of course. And uh, this interstage is a lot bigger than the real one. Uh, but you can see in here what I did was I took a regular KW rocketry decoupler right there, which then separated it from the actual fairing right here, which was then in turn on top of a procedural fairing that worked as the interstage. For balancing it with the RCS in every direction, you can see here that we have a very little rotation in any direction, none in that direction. And uh, that doesn't seem right. This, when I set this up, there was no rotation whatsoever. That's easy enough to do. It was a little bit more like that, I think. It was very low. I'm not quite sure what happened with the save in between, but you can see that it doesn't really have much of a rotation in any direction, which means that I can use that monopropellant to stay on course while the solid rocket booster is firing. And yes, that is a solid rocket booster for a second stage, like I said earlier, and on top of it, a decoupler to separate it from the payload. Now the payload, like a real Cygnus orb, has its avionics section down here and its payload up there with a common berthing node up there. I put lights on mine, of course, because we gotta have more lights. Solar panels on the two sides here. Engine on the bottom is probably a little bit more powerful than it really should be, but that's just because I don't wanna wait forever for these things. I'm the kind of person who, when I should be using a nuclear engine for higher efficiency, I just wanna get things done, and so I use more powerful engines on there. We have monopropellant in every direction on this. This was also balanced. Uh, I've already taken some off, so it's not gonna be easy to show you, but that was balanced too. It's, we have our antenna on there, fuel tank, our CPU. If we open this up, we can see more of the avionics section. So there you go. You can see it's got a whole bunch of batteries inside. It's got the monopropellant tanks, a cooling unit, remote tech antenna, a bunch more batteries down here on the bottom. And that moves up into these compartments, which are actually where we store all of our life support. Lots of food because you can't really recycle the food right now. I think in my next game, the next series, I am going to have the ability because I'm going to create it myself to uh, grow food as life support and then a lower amount of oxygen and water because I can actually create oxygen and water while I'm in orbit. More lights. And there's our docking node on top of a separator that separates it from the inside where all the rest of the goodies were. And that is about it. Next time on Project Gateway, it looks like we are bringing it to a close. It's just too slow up there at the station. And before you start giving me lots of suggestions for how I can go about speeding things up, whatever you might follow with, have you tried? I have tried, trust me. Texture sizes, texture qualities. I have a high-end computer. I have a high-end graphics card. It has nothing to do with graphics settings anyway. My physics is set to the best possible setting to try and improve, improve speed. I cannot do any more welding that will make it any better. I've tried removing all of my DLLs and that still doesn't improve things. I've tried part optimizing and it's not improving. It has nothing to do with RAM, so don't anybody try to say, oh, you need more RAM because it's a 32-bit it's a application. I'm running in Windows, which means there's a four gigabyte limit on memory, no matter how much I have in my computer. I think that there might be some sort of order n squared operation that simply crossed over a magic line and started going very high into the geometric progression of how much slower it's getting by whatever it is that I'm doing up there. And there's nothing I can do. So we must bring this to an end. And since we had to end it eventually anyway, next episode is as good a time as any. So what I'll do next time is we'll get into what's actually going to happen as a result of us bringing this to a close and what will it mean for the next series. So until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.